Hi everyone, my name is Hannah and welcome to tonight's interactive stargazing. So tonight we have an awesome list of objects to view and I'm really excited to get started. But before we get started, I'd like to introduce the telescope and the software that we're using tonight. Uh, so tonight we're using our 17 inch plane wave telescope with a Malincam DS10 C-Tech camera to the back of it. So basically that's just fancy words for it. It's a camera that's going to be taking pictures of objects tonight. And so these pictures are called exposures. And so we'll look at an object for a certain amount of seconds and then we'll get this really, really awesome picture. And so tonight I wanna to start off with something really, really cool. So we're gonna start off with a galaxy called the Whirlpool Galaxy. And so while we switch to different objects, uh, Sarah is actually working uh, the software that we're using, the Malincam Sky software. And so you can see how she can point to a different object and it will move the telescope to this object. And so right now we should be slewing to the Whirlpool Galaxy. And I think this is a super cool galaxy just because it's really, really visually appealing. It's a spiral galaxy and it's actually having an interaction event. Ah, oh, there it is, awesome. And so you can see uh, on right in the middle of the screen, we have this beautiful spiral galaxy. And then below we have this tinier spiral galaxy that's interacting with this larger one. So these two galaxies, uh, one's feeding off of one another. And I like this one too, because you can kind of see uh, the flat on structure of a spiral galaxy. And so you can really see the structure of the arms. You can see the central bulge. And I just think this is a very, very beautiful galaxy to look at. So as you can see, Sarah's moving up and down with the different things that we can do to this picture. And so throughout the night, you might see her moving something called the gain, which is basically the camera sensitivity or the exposure time, which is clicking up and down to different seconds or even changing the saturation or the hue. But I think this picture looks pretty, pretty good uh, for what we have right now. And so we'll be seeing a lot of galaxies tonight. So please feel free to recommend different objects that you wanna see throughout the night. And yeah, so let's go to something else now. Uh, if you want to move it to M13. So uh, for the beginning half of this, maybe for the next 10 minutes, I'm just gonna go 
through one of each object, popular objects that are in the sky, like galaxies, stars, star clusters, uh, nebulas, and things like that. And so the next object that I, uh, we move the telescope to is going to be M13, which is a globular star cluster. And so these objects are a lot older. Uh, than most of the stars that we have. And so these clusters actually orbit around the center of galaxies. And as you can see, there's a whole bunch of stars that are really, really condensed in one small area and they look like globs. So that's why they're called globular star clusters. And so M13 is a pretty notable object. It is called the Hercules cluster and that's because it's in the constellation Hercules and it's around 22,000 light years away and it has around 300,000 stars, so not, not too many. And what's really, really cool about this cluster is that in 1974, the Arecibo telescope actually sent a message to this globular star cluster. And so this message contained information about like the human race, DNA, atomic numbers, uh, stuff like that. So if any aliens wanted to find us, <laughs> they could locate where we are. Uh, but so, something kind of trivial about that signal though is we don't know if m13's position is actually going to be there when the signal gets there so remember it's 22,000 light years away so it's going to take a while for that message to get there but i think it's pretty cool that we have done that and so that is a globular star cluster and so now we're going to go to a different object uh, called an open star cluster. So this one will be M24. And so you can see Sarah clicking M24 there. And also I really like this view because you can see the telescope actually moving to that object. And then you can see all the different constellations. You can see other objects. And when the telescope moves in the exposure, because we're taking a live feed of pictures, sometimes you'll see streaks in the exposure. And so that has to do with the telescope moving. So the stars are actually just streaking, um, but it's not any comet or a shooting star or something like that. But so what we have right now up is M24. This is the Sagittarius star cloud. So it's around uh, 10,000 light years away in Sagittarius. And this star cloud, you actually can't see it, but around these uh, clusters of stars is actually a nebula, an emission nebula. It's, call it's a, called an H2 ionized region. So we have this hydrogen, uh, atomic hydrogen gas that's being ionized. And so it looks really pretty, but unfortunately with the camera that we have, we don't have a special filter to see this nebula, but you can still see the open cluster in this young nebula. And so uh, this uh, open star cluster has this nebula that makes little baby stars. And so open star clusters are stars that are around the same age that are formed in the same region, usually in nebulas like this. So that's why I wanted to show you guys an open star cluster compared to globular star clusters where it's not so condensed and circular, but it's more spread out. Um, so up next, we're going to look at an actual uh, nebula that you'll be able to see called the Ring Nebula. And so the Ring Nebula is also a very, very visually appealing object. It is in the constellation Lyra. And this nebula is different from the star forming region. So this kind of nebula is called a planetary nebula. And as you can see why it's called a planetary nebula is because it's very, very circular and it has all these different colors. And so uh, you can see there's red, there's blue, there's some yellow, and then right in the center is actually a little tiny dot. And that little tiny dot is called um, a white, a white dwarf. Sorry about that. So it's a white dwarf. And so what, how this feature forms is when a star around the size of our sun dies, there's these outer shells of the star that start to drift off. And basically that gas that you're seeing is that those shells. And then that white dwarf is actually the leftover core of that star. And so that's that white dwarf there in the ring nebula. And so there's a bunch of planetary nebulas up right now. And yet again, they're from smaller to medium sized stars that die. But what about big stars that die? And so we don't have uh, 
I think in a few minutes we'll be able to get a supernova explosion. Uh, I think right now someone is asking to see a supernova in M85. Uh, so we can actually go there. Let's, let's see that. And then a little bit later, we'll see a better one. And so as you can see right now, Sarah's typing in M85. And so we have two different catalog names that actually show up there. You can see M85 and then it's NGC name. So I'll talk about that very briefly. And so when we talk about objects that have M in front of their names, that is the catalog where that object is. So M stands for Messier. And so there was this guy, uh, Charles Messier, who was a comet hunter. He was trying to find comets. And he found actually maybe around 13 comets, but found around 110 other objects. And so he put all these other objects in this catalog that weren't comets, basically. And then NGC stands for the New General Catalog. There's a lot of objects on the NGC catalog. There's around uh, maybe 8,000 objects compiled by someone called uh, John Dr Dreyer in 1888. And so they're constantly updating this NGC catalog. And so as Sarah says right here, uh, pulled up with the telescope, this object, I believe it is M85, you can see that there actually is a supernova in this, I believe it's a galaxy. And so supernovas are when older stars, much larger, larger stars, 10 times bigger than the sun die. And they have so much energy, they're so dense, that when they die, they go out with a really, really big bang. And these bangs are some of the most energetic uh, explosions that we have in the whole entire universe. And so that dot in the middle is actually the core of the galaxy. And then that circled part is the supernova. And so as you can see, that supernova is almost as bright as the galaxy itself. And so sometimes they can even overshadow their own host galaxy. That is how enormous and how bright these explosions can be. So that is a super, super cool object that we're looking at right now. And it's really, really bright. I think we looked at it last week and it was a lot more dim. So feel free to go back and check out one of the older stargazing events. I believe it was uh, at the end of May where we looked at this object and it was a lot dimmer, but now it is pretty bright. And so, from stars dying to just regular stars themselves, let's go and look at yeah, Antares. And so Antares is an orange star in the constellation Scorpius. And so the reason why it's called Antares is ba basically the name means not Mars. And the reason why they call it that is because it's so orange. People would always say, oh, is that Mars? Is that Mars in the sky? So I'm assuming, I don't know the history behind it, but I'm assuming they're like, no, it's not Mars. It's Antares. And so Antares is a red giant star. It's getting towards the end of its life where it will probably die and either have a planetary nebula kind of death or a supernova, but it's looking more towards a planetary nebula kind of death. It really isn't that big. It doesn't have that much mass. And so the outer shells of that star will just drift off. And so, yeah, pretty bright star. So let's see. All right. So let's see, look, some of the recommendations that we have. M4. Let's see M4. So we have a question when it comes to M4, why is M4 different in its stellar population? It has several blue stars, younger stars compared to the often. So I'm assuming this is a globular cluster or a, yeah, a globular cluster. Let's see how this looks. Oh yeah, that's a awesome cluster right there. So M4, I don't know too much about the details of M4, but these globular clusters are generally around the same age. And so we think that around when our galaxy formed, these globular star clusters formed around the same time. So they're generally around the same age. Uh, the reason why they could have different colored stars compared to red or blue is actually because of the temperature of stars. So a red star could indicate something that's a lot more cooler. Uh, think of it like a flame. So the cooler 
part of the flame is the red part of the flame. And the really, really hot part of the flame is that blue. And so blue stars are generally a lot, lot more harder, uh, hotter than the red stars. And so that could be the difference in why we see different colors in these stars. And so yet again, we can actually make out sometimes the, uh, res the individual stars in these clusters. And so different uh, astronomers, stellar astronomers, astrophysicists look at these different stars to actually understand more about globular clusters. And so while we know they're around the same age and uh, they were formed around the time the galaxy formed, we still don't know too much about them. And there is some theories that uh, globular star clusters could be remnants of other galaxies that our galaxy kind of cannibalized or ate during its formation. So really, really cool globular star cluster there. So people are asking about looking at Jupiter or Saturn. And so I believe they should be good to look at right now. And so let's look at Jupiter first. So planets are my favorite things to look at. I think the planets are super, super cool. So I believe we're going to Jupiter right now. And so Jupiter is a gas giant. Oh my God, look at that, super cool. So as you can see, you can see a few dots around Jupiter right now, and those are actually the moons of Jupiter. And so from left to right, we have Callisto, which is the furthest one. We have a dot really, really close to Jupiter, and that is Europa. And then to the right, we have Ganymede, that's the one closest to Jupiter, and then we have Io. And so those moons are really, really large. They're actually around the same size or even bigger than our planet Mercury. So that's why we can actually see them super well. And then you can see Jupiter there. Uh, it looks really, really bright. And it's kind of hard to resolve Jupiter's storms and the different bands with our telescope. You can barely, barely faintly, oh, that looks super cool. I haven't seen it like that. You can see the different striations and stripes on Jupiter. And so those are the different storms that are happening there. And so we actually think that those different colors on Jupiter are because of the different levels of gas and cloud that are in the atmosphere. So Jupiter is this big, big gas giant and has different densities of gas depending on what they're made of. And so we actually think those darker colors on Jupiter are a lot more deeper in the atmosphere. And those brighter ones are a lot more higher. But yet again, Jupiter is a super, super massive planet that we don't really know too much about. We've only visited just a few times. And because it's so massive and it's made of gas, we have nothing like that here on Earth. So replicating its conditions in labs are actually pretty difficult. And so we're still trying our best to learn more about Jupiter, but we know more about the moons. And so uh, the moons are super cool around Jupiter. Like I said, we have all four peeking out, all four big ones. Jupiter has around 80 moons now. The number keeps rising constantly. But these four moons, I think, are the coolest around Jupiter, especially the moon Europa. And so... Europa is a moon that's actually made of water ice. And we can tell this through spectroscopy, which I'll get into just a little bit later. And so we actually think that Europa could possibly have a water ocean underneath its crust of ice. And so that is a highly anticipated target when it comes to NASA missions. And so I think we have a mission proposed to go to Jupiter's moon Europa called the Europa Clipper mission. And people that I do research with are actually building instruments for that mission right now. So pretty cool, but it won't launch anytime soon. So come back in 20 years, and I can tell you about Europa. <laughs> but so let's see. Uh, oh, also, Jupiter is actually going to be in opposition soon. And so what opposition means, it's going to be in its closest, its closest orbit, uh, I believe, to Earth. And so that live stream will actually be happening July 13th at 9 o'clock Arizona time. And so that's going to be a really, really cool stream. It shouldn't look too much different than it does tonight. It should look pretty much the same. Uh, but it's a really cool live stream that will talk all about Jupiter and its moons as well. So if you're interested in that, I definitely recommend checking it out. Oh, so correction, Earth is closest in, it, in our orbit and Jupiter is opposite the sun in our sky. So pretty cool. And as you can see there with Jupiter, someone's pointing out that you can see the atmospheric disturbances. So when it comes to other objects like stars or these planets, you will see them kind of look like they're 
moving around like they're floating. And that's because of the atmosphere, uh, the turbulence that's going on. So when we're looking at these objects, we're looking through our atmosphere and Jupiter is pretty low in our atmosphere right now. So we're looking through all this different gas, pollution, all this stuff, light even. And so it's kind of making the object look like it's moving around. So think of it like when you're at the bottom of your pool, when you look up from the bottom of the pool, you can kind of see the water moving around, the light flickering around. It kind of is the same effect that we get with our atmosphere. So watch out for that when we do other objects as well. So let's see, what else do we have? Saturn. So yeah, let's check out Saturn. So again, Saturn, I think Saturn is my favorite planet to look at. It is so beautiful. You can see the rings, especially in person through a telescope. It looks so amazing. So you can see here, we can actually make out the rings of the planet. And then the planet itself, unfortunately, doesn't look like we can see any moons. Uh, those moons are a lot smaller than Mercury. Oh, possibly. It looks like there's one moon there. I believe. Oh, my gosh. Actually, there's there's quite a few. So I believe I don't know which order the moons are in, but I know there's Phoebe, Phoebe, there's Ipetus, there's uh, Dione. Uh, I don't know which other ones are up right now. So those are possibly the ones possibly Titan. Uh, let's see. Yeah, Titan. So yeah, so the rings of Saturn are a very, very beautiful object. People always are wondering about the rings of Saturn. Is Saturn the only planet that has rings? And so we actually know that all of the gas giants do have rings as well. They're just very, very faint. Saturns are very prominent uh, because of a recent collision we think that happened with some of the moons around Saturn. And so how uh, new we think these rings are is around when the dinosaurs were around if they could have a telescope and look at Saturn We don't think they would see rings. So it's a fairly new Object and so because they're so new and because of the gravity around Saturn We don't, actually don't think these objects are going to last long as well And so they're going to coalesce and they're going to crash into one another and create little tiny moons inside of the rings and so we won't be around for that, but eventually they will coalesce into their own little moon system. And so the rings of Saturn differ in size. Some can be little tiny pebbles around the grain of sand. And then some of the rocks in there can be around mountain size or house size. It can be very, very huge rocks going around. And that's exactly what they are. They're rocks and ice and debris really going around Saturn. And so yet again, they look so beautiful. If you have the chance to look up a picture of Saturn's rings close up, I really recommend doing that. It looks so amazing. But so Saturn and Jupiter are the two main big planets that are up in the sky right now. We do have one other planet that's up in the sky right now, which is Pluto. So depending on what you believe, uh, Pluto could be a planet or not. And so the reason why Pluto is not a planet is because in 2006, the IAU decided that it was not, uh, it could not clear its orbit. It wasn't big enough to clear its orbit. So it got demoted to a dwarf planet. But I actually think that makes Pluto 10 times cooler because dwarf planets are some of the most interesting and unstudied objects in the solar system because they're so far away. And some of them are so dark that it's really hard to resolve them. So luckily, we have been to Pluto just recently, I believe it was 2016, where we sent the New Horizons telescope to Pluto and got some really cool pictures of it. And as you can see in the screen, it doesn't really look like anything. You can't, if you could point out Pluto to me right now, please tell me which one it is. It's really hard to see. It blends into the background of the stars. And so in around early 1930, 1929, Clyde Tombaugh, who worked up here at Lowell Observatory, was sent off on a mission to find Pluto. And so this mission was very difficult. So we used something called the Blink Comparator to compare objects of Pluto back and forth to one another to see if they could find this planet X. It wasn't called Pluto at the time. And so we're going to pretend to be Clyde Tombaugh right now and see if we can find Pluto. And so while Sarah messes with the image, basically what the Blink Comparator did was the Blink back and forth two images taken at the same time, 
different nights of the same star field to see if they could find an object moving, basically. And so what we did with our own plane wave telescopes was take pictures of the same part of the sky, uh, different times, uh, different days of the week, and we can flick them back and forth, and you can see actually a little tiny dot moving. And so it looks like this picture maybe is a little out of, out of correction there. So you can't really see that dot moving. So maybe we won't be able to pretend like we're Clyde Tomba. Uh, but it was a very, very painstaking process. He spent five to eight hours a day flipping back these photos back and forth, back and forth, trying to see if he could find a little tiny dot moving. And so sometimes he'd actually uh, get them mixed up with asteroids or something like that. But, oh, actually, here it is. And so, okay, so see if you can find a little tiny dot moving. I'll give you a few seconds and then we'll point it out. And so this is what Clyde Tombo would do every single day for hours and hours, weeks and weeks, days and days. All right, are you ready? We're gonna point it out. Okay. So let me get my annotation here. So do you wanna flick it back and forth one more time? All right, so if you can look right in here, that is actually where Pluto is. And you can see a little tiny dot moving just, just a little bit. And that's how Pluto was discovered here at Lowell Observatory. So pretty cool that that object is up tonight. And so unfortunately, you know, when you're up here at the observatory at the Goto, at the Clark Telescope, uh, we can't see Pluto because it is so tiny. We can't resolve Pluto. And that's why we actually had to go there. And so just a reminder, that's not a live picture of Pluto. Those are taken from a few months ago. Uh, taken at different times. So let's see, let's see some recommendations that we have. Uh, let's see M8. So let's see what this object is. So it looks like, um, oh, the lagoon, oh, okay, awesome. So the Lagoon Nebula is a really, really cool region. It really looks pretty. Uh, the Lagoon Nebula is in the constellation uh, Stax Sagittarius. It's an emission nebula. And so basically what that means is the nebula is emitting light and it's around 4,000 light years away. It's actually a star forming region. And so you can see all these pretty different colors here. You can see some dark parts. That's our, those are actually uh, darker and thicker parts of the nebula that are actually obscuring uh, the light that's being emitted from this nebula. And so like when we were looking at the open cluster, these uh, star forming regions are forming these little baby stars. So over time, the Lagoon Nebula will be eaten up by these little young stars and become an open cluster. And so something that might be a little bit more familiar when it comes to these star forming regions is the Orion Nebula. So unfortunately, the Orion Nebula is not up right now. It is a winter, uh, winter constellation. Uh, but when that is up, you know, it's a very, very popular object. And it also is a star forming region, makes these little tiny baby stars. Uh, those baby stars have a lot of stellar wind. So it's blowing that nebula apart. And then it gets very, very diffuse, very wide. And then eventually all that gas becomes eaten up and then we get an open star cluster. And so those different colors that we see in the Lagoon Nebula are actually because of the different elements that are in that nebula. So I believe there's some oxygen in there, there's some hydrogen, and uh, that's how you know we get these stars forming is because of all these different elements. Uh, yeah. And so someone asks, is Neptune up yet? So unfortunately, Neptune is not up. Uh, I don't think Neptune rises until very, very uh, late. And unfortunately, we won't be able to see it tonight. And so the only planets that we'll be able to see tonight are Jupiter, Saturn, and Pluto. So those are the only ones. But if you are an early riser, you will be able to catch Venus and Mercury if you have a telescope. I don't know if you'll actually be able to see that one, but uh, Venus is very, very early in the new. Uh, morning. And something else I would like to bring up uh, while I'm on that topic about the early morning is Comet Neowise. And so, Sarah, do you 
potentially have a picture of Comet Neowise. Um, this object is going to be very, very early in the morning, around 3 to 5 a.m. As the days go on, it's going to get later. And uh, eventually, I think it's going to uh, appear in the evening sky. So this comet, Neowise, yes, there it is. It's a, it's a fainter object. So you're going to need a, a telescope, binoculars, or take some exposures to see this object. And so it, it's really, really cool. It has a really close approach to the sun. I think it already had its closest approach to the sun. And so what you're actually seeing is it going away now. It's going to be going back towards uh, where it came from in the outer regions of the solar system. So yeah, let's see if we can see some other cool things though. So let's try M20, the Trifid Nebula. And so that is actually an object that I had on my list. So as you can see, it's a little bit above Sagittarius there. Yeah, so here in this uh, field of view, you can actually see what the telescope moves to, the different objects. and what I like about Sagittarius is it looks like a little teapot. <laughs> so if you can see the shape of the little teapot there, you can actually see a little teapot in the sky and that is Sagittarius. And so this object is a little bit above this. And so I like Sagittarius because of the pretty colors or uh, the Trifid Nebula. I like this because of the pretty colors. Again, it's this ionized uh, atomic hydrogen and the name uh, Trifid actually means divided into three lobes. And so as you can see, we have this dark nebula that's on top of this emission nebula and the Trifid Nebula actually has quite a few nebulas put into one. So there is an open cluster, there's an emission nebula, there's a reflection nebula and a dark nebula. Oh, and it looks like there's a streak across uh, the image and so that what that potentially is could be a plane or it could actually be a satellite or something like that. So while it takes in all this light and this exposure, objects could potentially move in front of it and they'll go away once the new exposure is taken. And so this object is around 5,000 light years away from us. So it's pretty far and yet again, it's making little baby stars. So usually when we have these very dense regions of gas, they form little baby stars. So I think they're really, really pretty. And you can see all the different colors in there too. So that's really awesome. Let's see, do we have any other recommendations? Um, let's try some galaxies. So although I'm a planetary scientist, I think galaxies are some of the coolest things to look at besides the planets. So let's try potentially the black eye galaxy, if we could get that. So we have a really cool array of different galaxies up right now. We have elliptical galaxies, we have spiral galaxies, we have lenticular galaxies, we have starburst galaxies, and that's all because of the position uh, that we're looking at in the sky right now. So if you can see in this little region, uh, we can see all these different galaxies. So all these little green circles are a whole bunch of, oh my gosh, look at all those. That's super cool about this program. And you know, the time of the year that we're in summer is you can see all these different galaxies right now. And so the black eye galaxy is a really, really cool object. Oh my gosh, it's my favorite. It looks so cool. And so this black eye galaxy is actually a spiral galaxy. And so to me, I actually think it looks like a protoplanetary disk or a newly formed solar system, but it's not, it's a galaxy. And so the reason why that is, is that these spiral arms are actually really, really dense and they're really close together and there's a lot of them. And so when we look at these images, they look like it's just this big ring of dust. And so some galaxies actually look like that. So we'll get to that in just a second. But I just think this galaxy is super beautiful. You, can, you can't really make out the spiral arms, but you can really see that structure. You can see the disc, you can see the bulge. I think it looks really awesome. So to point out some of those features, let's go to a galaxy where we can actually see that. So let's possibly try the Sombrero Galaxy, just because you can make out the features of that. So someone asked for the Cigar Galaxy, but unfortunately that galaxy is behind the roof of the Godot. And so if you guys saw the view of the Godot before we started, the Godot has this big roof that we actually have that goes on top of the telescopes to protect them from the elements. And so when that roof slides back, it's actually facing in kind of the north direction. And Ursa Major, where the Cigar Galaxy is, is actually right behind the roof. So it can actually obscure some of the objects that we see, but 
not too much. We can see the whole entire sky besides that. Oh, okay, cool. So here we have the Sombrero Galaxy. So I'm going to uh, point out some features in this galaxy that we can see. So this is an edge on lenticular galaxy. So what a lenticular galaxy is, is kind of a merge between a spiral galaxy and a, an elliptical galaxy. And some people like to say that it's a spiral galaxy without any arms. It's just one big disk. And so right here through the center, that's not the straightest line, <laughs> but that is the main disk of the galaxy, these spiral galaxies. This one's edge on, but some of them are flat. And those are where that active star forming region is. That's where that gas is, just like in, um, those star forming nebulas, where all that gas is, stars form. And so that's where we have that main active young star formation. And then towards the center here, we have our central bulge. And this is where older stars lie because they've had a long time to live in the galaxy. They've had a lot of interaction with one another. So they can move up and down and create kind of this bulge shape around uh, the center of the galaxy. And so a lot of these spiral galaxies, we believe, have supermassive black holes in the center of them. And those globular star clusters that I was showing you before actually orbit all around uh, kind of the center of the galaxy like this. So they don't orbit around the, the disk, they orbit around the center of the galaxy. So cool little diagram that I can make for you guys right now. All right, so I believe someone asked to see the Sculptor Galaxy, but I don't think that is up right now. Um, let's see, let's try M83. So let's see. Mm, okay, so it's called the South Pinwheel. It is in the constellation Hydra, and it's around 15 million light years away. And so what we're going to be viewing is kind of a face on spiral galaxy where I can show you more of the structure, just like the first galaxy that I showed you, the Whirlpool, uh, where you can really see the structure of the spiral arms. You can kind of get to see all the different cool features in these different galaxies. And so after the spiral galaxy, I think I'm gonna do uh, an elliptical galaxy. Oh yeah, so this one is called a barred spiral galaxy. And the reason why that is, is because it looks like there's a bar right in the middle of this galaxy. And then around you can see our different spiral arms. That's where that young star forming regions are. So yeah, pretty cool galaxy right there. And so before I move on to uh, some different nebulas, let's try one more thing, which is M87. So I showed you guys a bunch of spiral galaxies, a bunch of kind of in between there, but I'm gonna show you a different galaxy that looks completely different from these spirals. And it's called M87 or Virgo A. And so this galaxy actually has a lot of significance because we actually took a picture of its central black hole. So how did we do that? How do we take a picture of a black hole? Well, you can't. You can't take a picture of a black hole because it's black. All the light is being sucked into it. So how did we get this picture? So what we did was we had different radio telescopes from all around the world connect to one another to make something called an interferometer. And interferometers are actually used a lot in astronomy to take pictures of objects that we normally wouldn't be able to see. And so these different radio telescopes weren't actually taking pictures with visible light, they were taking it with radio wavelengths. And this interferometer adds up all these different radio wavelengths together to create this magnificent zoomed in picture of the supermassive black hole. And like I said, you can't take a picture of the black hole. That's it's right in the middle, but around you can actually see the light and the debris disk around that supermassive black hole. So it's a very, very cool picture. But besides that, that's, this is what the galaxy looks like. And so Virgo A is actually called an elliptical galaxy. It's a very, very large, diffuse kind of circular galaxy. It doesn't have any structure. It's just kind of like a blob. And so these elliptical galaxies, we believe, are a lot older than spiral galaxies. And the reason why we think that is because they've had a lot of time to interact with other galaxies, pass by, all the stars had a lot of time to interact with one another. So they kind of get this diffuse, big blob shape. Uh, so yeah, so elliptical galaxies are a lot older than spiral galaxies and they don't have any structure. 
uh, some details about this. I think I already said it. It's 53 million light years away, and it's an elliptical galaxy. So, yeah, pretty, pretty cool thing that we did there. All right, so let's move on to some nebulas because nebulas are really pretty. So someone recommended the Cat's Eye Nebula in Draco. So let's see that. The Cat's Eye Nebula is another planetary nebula. Let's see if we can get this one, actually. Oh, I believe we should be able to. But so this object will be a little bit more smaller. And you'll be able to see kind of those outer shells that were kind of pushed off towards the end of the star's life. Oh yeah, so it's this little tiny blue dot. And so if you have the chance to look up a picture of the Cat's Eye Nebula, it is this really, really crazy looking feature. And so planetary nebulas are some of the most complex features that we actually see because we still don't understand the mechanisms that form uh, these crazy shells. And so as you can see in the middle there, you can still see that white dwarf, the remnant uh, core of that main sequence star or that medium sized star uh, that once was. And so actually I forgot to mention this, uh, the sun is a main sequence star or it's kind of a medium slash smaller mass star. And so when the sun dies, the sun will actually become a planetary nebula. So we won't go out with this big, huge bang and make a supernova or a black hole, but we will get this really, really pretty uh, planetary nebula, this circular kind of region around our leftover white dwarf. So that's pretty cool. And when that happens, the sun will expand and it will actually expand past the orbit of Mars. So it's gonna get pretty, pretty big. And then the outer layers are gonna drift off and we're gonna get this pretty cool nebula. And so speaking of nebulas, uh, I believe we have, uh, or stars dying, we have uh, a supernova explosion right now called the Veil Nebula. Uh, so like we showed earlier in that uh, galaxy with that supernova, you could see that was very, very bright. And that was almost as bright as the central part of that host galaxy. Well, this is a supernova remnant that was in our own galaxy. And so we will be able to see the different features uh, that are left over when supernovas happen. And so this past winter, there was a lot of controversy with supernovas regarding Betelgeuse. And so this star Betelgeuse is a red supergiant. And these red supergiants, when they die, they go out with a bang. And so people oh, were constantly worrying about, is Betelgeuse going to explode? What's going to happen? And so we actually believe that this event that happened with Betelgeuse, uh, it was dimming uh, compared to everything else. So we think there was actually just gas that was being spit out by the star. But if Betelgeuse were to explode, you know, uh, possibly if there are people on Earth in the next few uh, thousand, a million years, they could see a remnant that looks like this. And so if you can see in the screen, there is a little bit of red, there looks like a little bit of purple going on. And that is the remnant of the different elements that were in that star. And so supernovas are really critical to star formation. And they actually are uh, critical to why we have life here on Earth. Oh, so there you go. So actually, I believe that red is uh, bleeding light from uh, some of the lights that we have there at the Godo, but that kind of wispy, purpley, other red color there is the Veil Nebula. And so like I was saying, supernovas are very, very critical to the formation of heavier elements. And so when these explosions happen, we have uh, atoms that are actually hitting each other at incredibly fast speeds and they connect to one another and they make heavier elements and that's the reason why we have heavier elements why we can have life here on earth why we can have earth here and our stars is because of stars exploding so it's basically all just recycled material you have stars that form in these nebulas and then these nebulas uh, kind of drift off and we get these solar systems and then in the solar systems we have the host star the these host stars eventually die. And then from that gas uh, that these host stars leave over, more stars form. And it's just like this continuous recycled event, which is really, really cool. So whenever you hear someone say, oh, we're made of stardust or we're made of star stuff, we are literally made of star stuff. If it wasn't for these explosions and stars dying, we wouldn't have life here on Earth, which I think is kind of beautiful. <laughs> 
So let's see, what else? What else could we have? Does anyone else have any recommendations? Um, while we wait, I'm going to look at some other objects. Let's see if we can get some more galaxies. I, I just really like the galaxies. Um, could we try uh, the firework galaxy? Did we see that? If it worked? Oh, and I think someone asked if M1 was available, so I don't think that object is available right now. I don't think it's up in the sky. Apologize about that. So let's see if we can see this firework galaxy. And so the firework galaxy is NGC 6946. Yep, it just says galaxy. So let's see what happens when we go there. It might, is it behind the dome? And so if anyone else has any more recommendations, please put them in the chat. We're doing a last call uh, for objects. And so let's see what we get. So this one, uh, we're just testing it out, seeing what happens. We haven't looked at this object before. So that's what I think is really cool about this system is we can go to different objects that we've never seen before uh, and you know, just kind of test it out, see what we get, see how cool it looks. And so, oh, look at that one. So this is called the Firework Galaxy. It's a spiral galaxy. And so a lot of the galaxies that we see are spiral galaxies, just because they're a lot more prettier to look at, they're more prominent uh, compared to elliptical galaxies. They're just, you know, blobs. Uh, but so this Firework Galaxy is in the constellation Cepheus and Cygnus. It's kind of like in the middle there. And this object is 22 million light years away. So that's pretty far there. But yet again, as you can see, it's a beautiful, beautiful structured spiral galaxy. Uh, you can see the arms. You can really see the central bulge there. And it looks probably like a firework. And I think there's a little companion there, possibly. Pretty cool. Okay. So let's see. Anyone else have any recommendations? Um, yeah, so some of my favorite ones uh, are behind the dome right now. Oh, could we possibly get the whale galaxy? Let's see if we can get that one. So the whale galaxy is a galaxy that kind of looks like a whale. So I think it, it's pretty cool. <laughs> I tried to get a picture of it the other night, but it was too bright. So we actually had, uh, the moon isn't coming up right now. So if the moon was up right now, it'd be harder to see these galaxies just because the light drowns out these fainter objects. And so the moon will be rising around like 11 o'clock or so, and it's going to be a uh, waning gibbous. But if you guys missed it, just a few days ago on July 5th, we actually had a full moon and a penumbral eclipse. And so if you guys didn't get the chance to see that or check it out, uh, feel free to go to Lowell Observatory's YouTube channel and look at the past live streams. And they did this whole live stream event on the penumbral eclipse. So that should be pretty cool if you guys have not seen that. But yeah, we're pretty fortunate right now to not have a bright moon out so we can see these really, really faint objects. It would be pretty difficult to see them if we did have a bright moon. All right, so let's see if we can get this galaxy. Looks like it's kind of taken a second there. And so as you can see at the very, very bottom of the screen, uh, there is an exposure time that shows how long these pictures are actually being taken. And so this one is actually taking around 23 seconds to allow light to come into the telescope and let us see these objects. So sometimes it's a little bit of a waiting game, but I think it's worth it. Oh my God, so cool. Oh, I think oh, I said the black eye galaxy is my favorite one, but this, this also is very, very high up there. So yeah, as you can see, uh, this is also, I believe a spiral galaxy. It's a barred spiral galaxy, actually. It's an edge on a uh, barred spiral galaxy there. And so you can actually see it has a little companion uh, to the bottom. 
bottom like left of the galaxy and it's in the constellation Canis Venatici and it's around 30 million light years away so it's a pretty pretty far object but I think it is so so cool little whale floating up <laughs> in the universe I think that's awesome all right, so we're getting close to time here. So we're gonna to try to move on uh, really quick to some of the last recommendations that we have. So it looks like we have M6 by Ken Conway. So let's check that one out. Oh, the butterfly cluster. Oh, we were actually looking at this one earlier. Okay, cool. So yeah, so the butterfly cluster is also another open star cluster and it's called the butterfly cluster because it's in the shape of a butterfly. So as soon as it loads here, we'll be able to draw out a picture of a butterfly for you. Oh, so you can see the stars are kind of streaking there. That's because the exposure was taking when the telescope was moving. And so although it's not like a perfect picture, I think the star streaky pictures are cool. So you can see like the telescope moving. But so I'm gonna draw a picture here real quick of a little butterfly. This is what we think it looks like. So here's like the middle of the butterfly. And then we got the wings of the butterfly that kind of go out like this. Doo -doo -doo. So there is our pretty butterfly cluster. I'll delete this there so you can see it for yourself. But yeah. It's a really, really cute open star cluster. And so like I was saying earlier, these are younger star clusters that form from their host nebula. Pretty cool. All right, and so let's try another one. So we have M11 from Jacob. So let's try that one. M11, oh, it's the wild duck cluster. So yet again, another cluster. So this one is a uh, open star cluster too, I believe. Let me double check. So the wild duck cluster, yes, is another open star cluster. So this one is in the constellation Scutum and it's around 6,000 light years away. And so the reason why it's called the wild duck cluster, this actually has been a mystery to a lot of the educators uh, for quite a while. We're like, oh, it doesn't look like a wild duck. Uh, we don't understand. But I actually figured out it's because there is this V-shaped formation here and people think that resembles the formation that flocks of ducks exhibit when they're migrating. And so that's why it's called the wild duck clusters because of that kind of V formation that we have going on there. So again, another very, very beautiful star cluster, uh, very young. All right, so we have a few more minutes to try just a few more. So we can actually try, someone's recommended to go back to Jupiter and see if the moons have moved. So that's a great idea that was suggested by Jason. Uh, so yeah, let's check that out. And so that's what's also really cool about having this telescope here uh, at the Godo is when you start off at the beginning of the night, you can go check out Jupiter in the telescope and then you can come back towards the end of the night and you can actually see that the moons have moved. And so I, I don't remember when we looked at it. I think we looked at it maybe at like 9.20. Um, so maybe it would have been enough time to see the moons move. Oh, and yeah, you can actually see uh, that Europa there has actually moved a little bit more towards the outside of its orbit. Um, it's not so close to Jupiter as it was before. The other ones, it's a little bit harder to tell just because they're really far out there, but Europa being a good reference point, you can see that it has moved just a tiny bit there. So super cool. I love Jupiter. Okay, let's see. Uh, Alan has recommended to see M17. So let's see what this object is. Oh, the Swan Nebula. Oh my gosh. I, yeah, this is another really, really awesome uh, nebula that actually looks like what it's called. It does look like a swan. And so this object's around 5,000 light years away and it's in the constellation Sagittarius. So yet again, it's a kind of star forming region, kind of H2 uh, region ionized. Uh, hydrogen gas there. Oh, and you can see the little swan. So I'll draw out the little swan here for you if you can't see it. So here's, oh my god, this is gonna be terrible. Here's the head of the swan. And here's like the body of the swan here. Okay. And there's like an eye right there. And then you can have the wings however you want. So that is our swan nebula. And this one has such 
beautiful, beautiful colors and it very, very vibrant. And so some of these H2 regions are actually a little bit harder to see without a filter on our telescope. And we don't have a filter on the telescope right now. And so it's really cool when we are able to see these really cool spectra and the really cool pictures uh, from these different nebulas. All right, and so I think someone's recommending the coat hanger cluster, but I think that one is actually too big uh, for our field of view from the plane wave, unfortunately. But I think someone's asking also for a binary star, so let's do that. Let's go to Albireo. And so this is probably one of the most popular binary stars in the sky. And so if you don't know what a binary star is, it basically means that there's two stars going around each other in their orbit. And so Albireo is a very, very popular one because you can actually see the different spectral colors of these two stars. So earlier I was talking about how stars could have different colors, and that is due to their temperature. And so you can see the star at the bottom right there is very, very blue. And the star to the top left, it actually in uh, the eyepiece when you see it is more of an orangey kind of amber color there. And so that's because the blue one is almost three to four times hotter than the, its companion, the orange one. And so Albireo is in the constellation Cygnus, the swan, and it's around 434 light years away. And so something else that's cool about Albireo is it's a binary star system, but actually the amber star called Albireo A is also its own binary star system. And so you can spectrally resolve that there is two stars going around uh, that amber star and then in itself is in another uh, binary star system. There, so cool. So it looks like we're gonna do one more object and then we're going to wrap it up for tonight. So we're going to be looking at Saturn just one last time just because it is probably the prettiest object uh, to see through an eyepiece. It is so beautiful, it's in our solar system. And you can see there the rings and the planet. And so the planet itself uh, actually isn't too spectacular. You can't resolve individual storms on the surface. You can't see any bands of color like you can with Jupiter. But when you look up pictures of Saturn, you can actually see that Saturn has storms on the north and south pole of it that actually form uh, different geometric shapes. So right now there's a big uh, hexagonal storm that's going on on the north pole, I believe. And so what we think is going on with that is that you know Saturn is also a gas giant. It's made up of all these different gases. And so when these gases are spinning really, really, really fast, we get something called differentiation of these gases. So the heavier gases kind of move to another part with the lighter ones uh, kind of float out towards the end and the heavier ones are in the middle and we can get these really, really cool shapes in these storms. And uh, yeah, so that's pretty cool. Yet again, it's really hard to kind of figure out what's going on with these gas giants uh, because we can't replicate uh, the situations that are here on Earth. All right. So thank you everyone so much for joining the live stream. I really uh, had so much fun looking at all these different objects tonight. And if you guys enjoy this, please uh, stay tuned for future events that are happening. Uh, be sure to join us Monday night at 9 p.m. PDT for special the special Jupiter live stream. And feel free to check out some of the past ones that we have done too. Um, and yet again, the Jupiter live stream will be an interactive stargazing event as well. So thank you guys so much. And I hope you enjoyed your time here with us today.